Hello and welcome to AMS live stream hour and our special series on electrifying vehicle production. My name is Christopher Ludwig, Editor-in-Chief here at Ultima Media and AMS. And I'm Nick Holt, Editor at AMS, and we'll be your host for today's session. We have a tour de force of a program focused on the impacts, challenges and opportunities for automotive suppliers in the transition to electrification, from chassis production to powertrain, robotics, automation and materials. And we're very pleased that we'll be joined on the show by some, some great experts from this in these areas, including from ZF, ABB, Henkel and Gestamp. Uh, and just a quick word on why we brought you here today and what we'll be covering across the program. So across the board, we're seeing an evolution of supply and manufacturing operations driven by the ongoing and accelerating transition to electric vehicles. And this the demands and challenges we're seeing include dealing with new components, requirements for equipment, software, and changing programs of management. And also new supply chains, especially around uh, battery packs, cells, uh, and housings. And there's even a, a greater need for, for production, for flexibility in production operations. Yeah, and we, we see in, in, in across our coverage in AMS and our conversation with industry, significant opportunities um, in this evolution, both for tier suppliers and, and production specialists. Uh, there's a rise in cellular and modu modular manufacturing, and that's bringing opportunities for automation, perhaps underused so far, and we'll hear more about that later. Uh, clearly more focus on light weighting, um, ways that you fit the components uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the vehicle and in the chassis. Um, and this is also leading to opportunities to, to further develop the materials being used, uh, as well as welding and forming processes. And, and I think like beyond the detail, it's also the partnerships and relationships that are changing. You know, we're seeing in a focus on design for manufacturing, right from engineering and product development um, through to manufacturing, as well as an evolution in the way that manufacturers uh, are serving the industry, for example, and becoming more full system suppliers. And we'll be covering all of these topics with our guests today. We have a great panel lineup. Uh, we have Arno Gullering from ZF, from Larsen from Gestamp, Tanya Vanyo from ABB, and Stefan Hoffer from Henkel. And what we're going to do is with this packed agenda, we're going to, we're going to break up into several segments here so we can go through the processes uh, with our guests. We'll start talking about changing supplier roles for powertrain with, with ZF. Uh, we'll move on to automation opportunities with Tanya from ABB. Uh, we'll talk about applications and EV and battery value chain with uh, Stefan Hofer from Henkel. And, and we'll take a tech, we'll, we'll have a, something of a case study zeroing in a bit more on manufacturing solutions for EV chassis, uh, including things like hydroforming. Uh, and then we're going to bring it all together, uh, everyone together for a Q&A at the end. And so throughout this, uh, this live stream, we really want your engagement. Send us your questions, your comments, and we'll put them to a panel. We may not have time to get to everything in the next 80 minutes. However, we will be sure to address each of those questions to our, to our panelists uh, beforehand for some follow-up. And just to say thank you, our today's show is in partnership with ABB uh, Robotics and Discrete Automation. The company is a pioneer in robotics, machine automation, and digital services and providing solutions for a diverse range of industries from automotive, electronics, and logistics. Henkel is a key partner and solution provider in the design, development, and manufacturing cars and lightweight vehicle structures. And with that, we'd like to, to kick off uh, our show today. Um, and our, our first guest is Arno Gullering, who is Senior VP Operations for Division Electrified Powertrain at ZF. He's overseen operations at the company's uh, this fast growing division since October 2019, playing a key role in scaling up production for ZF's EV customers. Uh, he has nearly 25 years experience in complex and advanced manufacturing at automotive suppliers. And Arno, it is our pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks so much for joining. Thanks, it's my pleasure to join you. Thanks for the invitation so much. Our pleasure, our pleasure indeed. Um, Arno, I want to start with some context. The share of the electrified vehicle sales is obviously rising strongly, especially in Europe, uh, even if ICE is, is, is in the majority. How significant so far is this transformation currently for ZF across your, your powertrain operations, electrified, and how do you see that evolving over the next couple of years? Um, I mean, in a nutshell, we see it um, accelerating big time. Uh, um, some sorts, 
Um, say it has been fueled by COVID, um, but I think we really at a deflection point now. We really at a, at a tipping point. Uh, we see the OEMs um, reworking their, their uh, strategies. We see uh, much more pull in the market uh, for the EVs. We see um, also the infrastructure catching up significantly. And uh, we're just in the strategic planning as we speak, and we really revise the numbers both for EV, for hybrid, and for the ICE. Yeah. And um, also internally, we started um, a big transformation program um, for our uh, division powertrain um, to merge um, the legacy, legacy business um, gearboxes with the new um, EV access motors and electronics business. Fantastic. And, and we also obviously see a rise in hybridization, plug-in hybrids, for example, mixing of, of powertrains. How much of an impact on your manufacturing is PHEV um, versus EV? Well, quite significant. Um, ZF um, is very well known for um, um, as a system supplier, so we're quite experienced with um, gearboxes since 100 years. Um, it's uh, quite known. But when it, when it comes to electrified uh, drivetrains, especially hybrid drivetrains, um, we see um, a huge um, growth in, in complexity. Now you have to, first of all, in engineering, in production, production engineering, in prototyping, and then afterwards in the series uh, production, you have to bring together all these uh, additional components. Uh, and in, in a nutshell, you have two drivetrains in one, yeah? and uh, that has to be aligned. Um, in uh, prototyping and also in the um, industrial engineering processes. And that um, for our um, um, development process that brought um, some significant, uh, let's say, um, challenges. Yeah? And uh, we um, come up with safe launch procedures and um, additional processes to align here. And uh, we learned uh, really um, sometimes in a hard way um, to, to fight against that. Yeah. One, one of the things we, we've talked about, and in fact, you recently spoke to, to AMS about as well in an article, is, is you know, the strategic partnerships and the changing relationships uh, between the tier suppliers and OEMs, um, talking about more supplying complete systems. What does this shift mean for ZF in the electrified powertrain space, where do you see challenges and opportunities in that? Oh, we may have had a moment of interruption no, here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're back now. Yeah, I don't see you. It, um, it, it probably will just, it's just a bit of a buffering issue. I'm sure it will uh, regulate. There you are, you're back. So let's... Uh, <laughs> Welcome to 2021. <laughs> uh, I mean, you have to see that the change to EVs, especially in such a quick um, speed now, yeah, uh, and, it, and as I said, it's really picking up also for the OEMs. They're revising their, their numbers, they're revising their volumes, they're revising their strategies. Also, the OEMs are a little bit overwhelmed by the speed which is picking up now. Yeah? And um, it, I mean, when you when you do such kind of a big transition, yeah, you have to think about your um, R and D capacities. Yeah, you're still with the with the ICE and and uh, the conventional powertrain, but where also new programs have to be ramped up, and uh, the industrialization uh, efforts as far as investment and and buildings and and uh, those things which are connected to that. Yeah, and that brings the whole industry. Um, to think about, yeah, um, do I have to do that by myself, yeah, or can I can I look for a partner, yeah, where I where I do that together with, yeah. Um, so that drives the whole idea of strategic partnership, yeah. And we are in serious production with uh, um, e Axel now with uh, Mercedes Benz, yeah, quite closely, um, and in uh, a number of development programs with all the, the other big manufacturers. And um, the challenge for the, such a strategic partnership, obviously, is, I mean, you have to disclose some knowledge. Yeah? You have to disclose your manufacturing knowledge. The uh, OEM has to disclose their um, product knowledge, yeah? tolerances, really, really knowledge, which is, which is key and, and USPs for, for their own product. Yeah? That's, that's a big challenge yeah? for both parties. Yeah? 
and sometimes you get uh, information too late and, and that drives uh, the whole, uh, let's say, industrial engineering process under extreme pressure. Um, there are also opportunities significantly. Uh, obviously, you can uh, bundle your R&D and, and uh, industrial engineering capacities that can bring uh, savings and, and, and synergy effects. Yeah? And ultimately, if you are able yeah, to align the design to somewhat modular to somewhat modular approach yeah, um, for the product and even for the um, manufacturing equipment, yeah, that brings huge synergy potentials to save money um, there. Yeah? I mean, obviously, you need complete new lines, you need complete new manufacturing um, equipment. Yeah? Um, the manufacturing equipment for gearboxes and, and the older ICE drive terms you pretty, pretty much cannot use yeah, to, to a huge extent. It's, it's outdated. And, and this huge shift of investment forces us to, to think about those strategic partnership approach. And, and actually on, on that point of, of the need for new, new, new lines, new approaches, new production, how, how are you adapting your manufacturing operations uh, to accommodate some of these these potential new relationships, products, competencies, and, and are there any examples that you can that you can share? Yeah. First of all, um, uh, for us, uh, it's it's um, also as uh, for everybody else, it's a it's a huge step. Yeah. And um, competencies you need. I mean, Celef very early decided to fully invest in the complete uh, value add of an EV uh, electronic drivetrain. Yeah. We invested in electronics. And we invested in uh, in Excel building and also in e motors. Yeah, um, this is absolutely necessary in my in our point of view because I mean overall the value um, depths of the complete drivetrain compared to the um, to the former ICE uh, value is, is around about 2.5 to one. Yeah, so you need from the employee point of view. Yeah. And uh, to really uh, take care of your people, yeah, you need to go into the full um, in, into the full value depths, and and then afterwards find out what is really the differentiator of the electric drive train in the future. Yeah, um, to build up so, such new competencies in a very quick way. Obviously, the quickest way um, is to do um, um, a merger. Yeah, and you probably you heard. Um, in, in the news that we acquired a Wapco company, yeah, that's more for the um, idea to go into autonomous driving. Yeah, they're quite uh, sophisticated in this area. Years ago, we we bought an electronic company to build up uh, quick knowledge in in um, the electronics uh, business. We do see um, the power units for the e-drivetrain as a differentiator probably more than the electric motors in the future. And uh, that's where we, where we invest um, a lot of our efforts in right now and also in the future. So, so quite, quite a significant transformation really in the overall scope and, and business model of, of, of ZF. And, and you know, one of, one of maybe the last question in our, uh, before we go through other segments here, um, as, as ZF takes more responsibility or seeks to take more responsibility for, for engineering of, of those EV systems and, and drivetrains and motors, as you mentioned, how, how does this impact how you plan and optimize your, your, your manufacturing operations? Uh, obviously, if you take more responsibility, you can design it the way you need it. Yeah? <laughs> and as I said earlier, I, especially in, in, the, in this situation where you have to invest such an amount of money because the change is so big, yeah, your aim is uh, modular modularization. Yeah, that, that you, for the product, but also for the manufacturing equipment, you go into models, yeah, and when you take over um, parts of the um, design um, tasks and the design responsibilities, you can optimize that for your, for your needs. Yeah, and that ultimately, um, so, uh, it, it lowers the price of, of the of the product afterwards, yeah, and it lowers the cost for everybody involved. 
So th th that I think is actually quite a, an interesting transition point because um, we have a, another guest coming on shortly who, who's going to talk a bit more about some aspects of I think modular production and and honor what I what I think what I'd like to do is um, uh, bring you back obviously as we mentioned um, at the end to to talk about this with our other experts. I think that was a great intro insight to what's happening in ZF. So so thank you very much for for for, for sharing those details with us. We will see you again really soon, um, a little bit later in the hour. So thanks again, Arno. Thanks for the questions. My pleasure. So also just um, if anybody is interested, um, please do. Um, check out a recent interview that we did with, with Arno Gullering in, in a digital edition and feature uh, on AMS. I uh, would we'll just put a link into your chat right there. You can click right through uh, to that to that edition where the interview with with, with Arno and others others were folks and his suppliers encourage you to check that out and get a bit more detail. But for now, let me hand back over to Nick. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Tanya Vanyo from ABB. A um, little bit of background, Tanya joined ABB in 1998, serving in various regional and global management roles with increasing responsibility in R&D operations and supply chain management, service and sales, and working in Finland, Sweden, and across Switzerland and in the US. And most recently, she held country managing director roles for including uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. Now, Tanya's taken up a new role in the company in charge as MD of their tier one business line. And I'd like to welcome um, Tanya in, into the discussion. Are you there, Tanya? Absolutely. I hope you can see me and I hope you can uh, hear me as well. That's great. We can, Tanya. Thanks very much. Um, well, just to start the, the conversation, really, um, your new role with ABB, could you talk about that a little bit and also ABB's decision to, to focus a particular division on Tier 1? Absolutely, Nick. And first of all, also thank you for the invitation. Super excited to join you this afternoon and pleasure to be part of the, the panel today. So going back to Tier 1, so I'm Managing Director of uh, Tier 1 Business Line within ABB's Robotics and Automation Business. And at Tier 1, we provide robotics and automation solutions, including what we call naked robots, but also function packages, complete application cells, a little bit what Arno was mentioning there, and all the way to full-blown uh, robotic lines to our customers. And then, of course, software for planning the lines, but also operating the lines, as well as lifecycle services uh, throughout the lifetime of our equipment. And now, if, if you look at tier one segment, I think out OEMs as our customers, they've been always from they've been always the pioneers of automation. I would say so. If uh, they've been running the in the front line of robotics, I would say, whereas the supply chain, I think, has still a way to go and exploiting the full benefits of automation. So we see that there, uh, there is a, a wave of automation that is still in front of us and not, not behind us. And at the same time, a little bit what, has, what you have mentioned and also what Arno was mentioning is that these automotive mega trends, they are just accelerating, including ele electrification. And this is bringing new materials, but also new technologies that really require brand new automation solutions, automation and robotic solutions. And here we see that our customers are really looking for partners that can offer them not only robots, but complete solutions. And we are drawing back uh, to the application know-how that we have from the past uh, and bringing it now into this, into this space, into automotive. And with that, uh, together with our application know-how and the broad portfolio that we have, it's, it's really a, a good fit uh, uh, in, in, in the industry to, to, to form the business line at the moment. I mean, you mentioned there that, um, that the OEMs have been leading on, on robotics and automation. Could you, could you offer some examples then of how and in which areas Tier 1s might extend their automation programmes? Good. I'll, I'll, I'll hang on to Arno a little bit and I'll start uh, going back to new technologies and, and, and maybe to, 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 to EV specifically. So if you look at uh, EV, for example, so you have, of course, the manufacturing of the battery trays, but you have also manufacturing of the battery packs. And if you think about batteries, there's actually quite a lot of chemicals and 
relatively dangerous materials uh, within the battery. So it's really natural that these processes and the manufacturing processes is automated from the very, very beginning. And so this uh, for sure is driving the, the extended automation. But then we also have areas that are still very labor intensive. And I'd like to maybe take seeds as an example. So if, if you look at the seed manufacturing, the metal fabrication of frames and mechanism, the welding processes have been automated a long time ago. But then the final assembly of the seed, uh, what is also called just in plant, uh, just in time plants or mm -hmm. GIT plants, they are still hugely manual operations. And now looking at the next level of productivity, the next level of flexibility, for sure, the next level of automation will be in this assembly space. The same is for textile. The same is to some extent also to car electronics that I think if com comparing the electronics industry in general are still uh, still a little bit uh, behind. But then I, I would say that the last uh, piece that is coming is materials handling and intra logistics within the factory. So there are still a lot of movement moving part from part uh, from place A to place B. And here we see not only robots that will play the role, but also the HEVs. I think coming back to Arno's point and what you mentioned earlier, and in all of this automation and, and looking at these new areas of automation, what I feel, what I perceive is that our customers are really looking at these modular solutions that are really easy to scale up globally because many of the companies that look at Kestam, ZF, Enkel, they have factories all around the world and they are really looking for solutions that are scalable, flexible, easy to deploy on a global basis and easy to use. So that's that's definitely one of the aspects that is important in, in this automation. And just going back to the point, some of the points you were making there, you, you mentioned some of the uh, final trim and assembly kind of operations. So what do you think it is that's prevented tier ones from adopting robotization into these areas? Very good question, uh, Nick. Uh, I think one of the important kind of element and aspect is that these the, these new areas they don't require poor robot only solution, but they really require automation solutions. And here we come into the collaboration. You mentioned it, Christopher mentioned it, Arno mentioned it, and I'll take a little bit new spin for the for the areas of collaboration because a lot of these areas happen very fast. Like you said, uh, Arno, it's really accelerating. And every time you need to develop something fast, you're going to be much faster if you do it with partnership. And if you try to do everything on your own in your little chamber, you know, this is not going to be the fast enough uh, approach moving ahead. And if I mirror that, what does it mean for automation? It's really then doing this, and, and, and maybe I would even use the word co-creation. So using the process expertise of the customer combined it with automation and robotics expertise of ABB, then we can really create automation solutions and not pure robots, but automation solutions very, very fast. And I think once you start to co-create and work closely together, then you can move also into what, what you also mentioned is not only designed for manufacturing, but designed for automation, because many of the parts, they are actually designed for a manual labor. And in order to take full effect and full benefits of automation, you really need to do sometimes design for automation, design for robotics. And of course, last but not least, you know, technology has also developed very, very fast, Nick. So just look at the vision, creepers, and I, I call them, these are the eyes and the hands of the robot, <laughs> the vision and the creepers. They have tremendously de developed over the past couple of years. And when we go to automation solutions, we really need, we really, it's not only about robots, but it's, it's about the solutions. And, and then you have aspects like easy to use, very much what we focus with in ABB, makes automation easier to also for SMEs to take advantage of automation, but certainly also the, the bigger tier ones, easy to use, is a key, key technology there. And then maybe last but not least, kind of tying it a little bit also together, what, I, what do I mean saying that it's not about robotics only, it's about automation solutions. In order to really gain the flexibility, it's about looking at the production chain as a whole. And then not only like how does my welding, arc welding process look for, for, for this part of the process, but how is the process in general? And there we talk about then cell-based manufacturing, which ultimately 
is really bringing the flex flexibility that is needed for our customers. That's a really interesting point. They move away from that sort of isolated view of each process. And um, you just quickly, you just mentioned um, cellular production there, and I know Arno mentioned it as well. Uh, this sort of idea of modular um, approach to it. Could you just shed a little quick insight into how you guys are developing that? Of course, for us, there are a couple of components, actually three components that come together. First of all, we are the basis of uh, cellular lines is what we call modular application cells. And the modularity is important for scalability. So we, in, 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 in my world, it, it needs to have these modular application cells or application process or process steps, as you call, uh, whatever you want to call them. Then you have the infra logistics that is connecting the cells, that is bringing the material throughout the process, and that that that's where the HEVs that's then beyond robotics. We talk about how also how, uh, talk about HEVs, but also these cells they need to be able to take the <laughs> take the. Uh, the HEVs in, so it's about also then making sure that these uh, these modular cells can work together with HEVs, and then it all ties together with software, because you need software today for data collection, for data analysis, and also traceability, traceability of quality and traceability of the process. So these are the three elements that I believe are very crucial building blocks of uh, cell uh, cell cell based manufacturing. And the, the benefit, I think the advantages are also uh, quite clear. So of course, if, if you build it from the modular scalable units, then you can drive the cost down. So you decrease the cost, but you also decrease the risk because you are not going into too many new new elements when, when you're building your lines. And, and then flexibility and ability to repurpose. So what I mean by repurpose, Nick, is then, for example, ability to run multiple parts per line, because when you go away from the fixed line that are bolted down to the fourth, your flexibility and ability to repurpose is very limited. Or if you have chicks and big fixtures that are limiting or designed for a part, then you can really only run one part per line. So, uh, so repurposing meaning gaining ability to produce multiple parts per line, but also adopting to the ever-changing volumes because we don't today it's so difficult to predict what what will be the volume in if you launch a new series or new platform what do, what's going to be the volume year one year two year three so ability to um, adapt I would say to the volume is extremely important and once you have the cell-based manufacturing that starts with modular cells you have to ability to what I would call lift and shift. So let's say that you have a line in, in North America, another one in, in, in China, and you realize that, okay, I need to you know, rebalance the capacity. I need to take some of that capacity from North America and move it to China or the other way around. You can simply take lift and shift a shift couple of these cells and they all have the same program. They have the same user, user manual. They have the same interface, the same HMI. And I think these are the benefits that are extremely important in this very volatile world that we have today. That's great. And that you've raised some really interesting points there. And I think we're going to probably pick up on some of those interestingly tied in with what Arno was saying earlier in our later panel discussion. So I'm going to say thanks very much for, for, for this for this quick interview. And um, you can okay. read some of our articles with uh, ABB on, on the website. I think we've just sent a link via the chat. Um, we have a number of um, articles with them regarding cellular, uh, cellular uh, production operations and also uh, managing data in automation. So you can go and have a look at those. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to hand back to Chris now for our next guest. Thanks, Nick, and, and, and thanks, Tanya. I think we have some great insights so far from both ZF and ABB. Um, I'm, I'm quite excited to bring on our next guest, Stefan Hofer. He's Global Market Strategy Head for eMobility at Henkel. Joined the company back in 2004, has held various roles uh, across autom the automotive side of the business, including in electronics and some of the early stages, I think, of what we might call the e-mobility capabilities at the company. Uh, and he's led the e-mobility strategy side since 2020. And Stefan, uh, I'd like to invite you to, to join me on screen slash stage. There you are, Stefan. Great to see you. Chris, hello. Thanks for having me. Pleasure being here, having a good discussion with you today. 
My pleasure, my pleasure. I thought where we might start actually is is a little bit about that e-mobility uh, division, you know, and tell us a little bit about what what the role there is and the strategy um, at, at Henkel, since there's so many components and parts of your business. Yeah, very good. So basically Henkel as a material supplier is um, already since uh, decades working in the automotive industry and also with all the changes towards the e-mobility, we have been starting a couple of years ago to investing further in that technology part. So we have an own part within our SBU in the automotive components world looking after the e-mobility. And when we at Henkel are talking about mobility, we are differentiating usually between what you can see on this slide on the left side. So the battery systems, everything in regards to power storage and on the middle and the right side, then power conversion. So basically the power electronics and the e-drive system. Um, when we are looking to the battery systems, we are seeing here that all parts of the battery, starting from the cell to the module to the pack, is part of our business. And um, I think, Chris, the slides will be also in the, in the record, so you can then see um, that we are having different technologies that we are offering for the, the different areas here. Today, we will be focusing more on the battery, I think. So that's uh, the next slide you were already showing, Chris. So just digging a bit deeper, what is Henkel doing then in a battery? So we are starting from the battery cell, basically depending on the type of cells, offering solutions. Uh, to use adhesives for structural bonding, so carriers to be uh, um, uh, basically bonded to the battery cell itself. We are looking to pouch cells when it comes to the cell-to-cell -cell bonding. So that's the, the part of the adhesive that we are doing on the battery cell. When it comes to the module level, we are typically talking about everything in regards to heat transfer. So here we are looking after the classical gap filler materials, but also thermal adhesives, type of battery adhesives, and also so the gasketing is already playing an area and role here in the module. And then when we're going to the right side, we are then thinking of the battery being then part of the structure of the car, of the car body. And here we are looking then in how to get the heat out of the battery module within the pack to the cooling plate. And we are also offering solutions then around gasketing and thermal propagation prevention, a very important topic. So that's a bit the different materials, the different topics uh, Henkel is working on since a while and where we are then also bringing our value to um, the OEMs and the tier ones for the electrification. Okay, thank you, Stefan. I think that gives us quite a good sort of sense of, of not only what, what Henkel is doing, but actually of the changing supply chain of, of the electric vehicle itself. Um, sure. Can you talk a little bit about what some of the key differences are in the materials, adhesives, and, and key key bonding aspects that you focus on um, for, for electric drive train production you know, compared to the, the traditional ICE business that you, that you have? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So, I mean, um, as, as, when, when you're thinking about the classical ICE, we are typically talking also about higher temperatures, right? So, uh, um, this means then whenever we were looking on any application before that was, as we called it, under the hood, so on, in, in the car, we were talking about high temperature resistance that needed to be uh, um, covered. We were talking always about um, certain oils and, and that kind of ATF liquids that we needed to cope with, be it then in the gasketing area to ensure that um, the, the um, different areas in the engine engine itself are protected against certain uh, of that liquids. On the other hand, when we were thinking about thermal materials as an example in an ECU or so, then it was always about reaching a 150, 180 degree temperature range that was then basically the working temperature under the hood. Um, when we are now translating that into the, the EV, what happened? I mean, on the one hand, when we are thinking about, for example, this gasketing solutions, then it's not about the temperature as such, but the kind of chemistry that we need to cope with has changed, right? I mean, we're talking about batteries, we're talking about battery chemistry, we're talking about all that cooling plates, liquid cooling systems that, that are implemented, right? So we are basically then looking after um, resistance versus um, water glycol as an example. Yeah? So this means that when we are thinking about this gasketing area, the kind of chemistry we need to protect for, we need to protect against um, has changed. And on the other hand, when we are then thinking about um, the thermal materials, um, here we were typically talking about a small area thinking about ECUs, et cetera, that needed to get the, the, the heat carried away. Now we are talking about a tremendous big battery, right? Um, that we need then with thermal material to make sure that the, the heat is carried away. 
So that's a very big challenge, a very big change in the consumption of material, uh, how much uh, dispense fast uh, we need to, to be in order to dispense all that material into a battery. So that's a, a very big difference. And last but not least, so we talked about gasketing and thermal materials also in the adhesives area. We, we see changes um, given as an example the cells you were seeing in the, in the picture we were showing before. So when it comes to bond the cells to such a carrier, we are talking about super fast assembly. So we need to find here solutions that can cure within seconds uh, in order to ensure a mass production of thousands of cells that are basically then implemented in one vehicle. So just to name a few for, for each area, the changes compared to the classical ICE, I would say. Yeah, and, and fascinating changes and something I think we'll pick up on a little more in the panel is, is, is you know, what, how you invest in and in, in gaining those new skills and competencies, particularly around things like those chemistries and, and points as you were raising. Um, when we talk about the materials, we were talking earlier, and I mentioned lightweighting, for example, the role that that plays. I mean, what what do you, from the materials point of view, what are the what are the important wins, and progress that you think need to be made or are being made for for EV and battery production? When we're looking to the to the battery, Chris, I think that. Um... Lightweighting is a very big topic, right? I mean, uh, um, Arno and uh, were, was talking about how fast the changes are happening today, how much the acceleration of electric mobility uh, has taken off in the overall industry. So that's also true for what we are working on. So in the first glance, it is about making things happen, right? So uh, ensure that we have the, the right level of uh, bringing the temperature, carrying the temperature away, making sure that the battery is working, right? In the next point, it's then about um, to, to say, how can we reduce weight? That's a very, very big topic. And you can imagine that if we are now talking about an average battery, we would say from our material, thermal interface material, you are adding two and a half, maybe three liters of material. So usually we're talking just about tiny little quantities here, we're talking really about volume. So this means this is with a certain level of density of thermal uh, conductivity, this is representing a heavy weight. Yeah? So that's an area where on the one hand, the optimization of the design is playing a very big role. How big is my gap? How thin can it become in order to use less material? Yeah? And uh, on the other hand, for sure, also we as materials uh, supplier are working on light weighting of that material, making sure that we are having lighter structures, looking into different kinds of technologies in order then to support also here the light weighting in the battery as, as such. Yeah? So that's a bit what, what we are doing in, in that direction. Um, other than that, we were talking about the design changes, right? So um, the, the mechanical tolerances is the one thing. On the other hand, we are seeing also many changes in the design of the battery itself. So when it comes to thinking of getting rid of uh, the module housing, maybe bringing the cells directly into the pack, uh, or also as we were seeing with the cylindrical cells, I mentioned it before with uh, plastic carriers, making sure that uh, we are also here talking about lightweight materials. That's where the adhesives from Henkel are playing in the end the role. So basically we are then the enabler, be it then for the fast cure adhesives um, to make this kind of assembly possible. On the other hand, when you're bringing the cell directly into the pack, you need to have an adhesion on the one hand, and on the other hand, you still need to take care of the heat. So that's when we are coming to thermally conductive adhesives. Adhesives is core business of Henkel, bringing now thermal conductivity in is what we are now bringing also here to the game in order to reduce structures and then also support the lie weighting. So that's a bit the first ideas coming to my mind, Chris. Yeah, just a few, <laughs> and 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 you, just, you raised. Uh, I mean, actually, you've mentioned a few times around the thermal management of, of the battery, and I thought, you know, maybe you can uh, just give us a bit of color on some of the key challenges and ways that you address that that thermal management uh, of production of EVs and, and charges, because it's such a key key part of this process. Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, I, I mentioned it just before that we are talking in the meantime really about liters, right? So again, you need to imagine that before, if we have been talking, uh, for example, about an ECU, we were talking about maybe 10, 15 cc that we were dispensing on the surface. And now we are talking about liters that need to go into such a battery. And that's for sure the, the area and one of the tremendous challenges to make sure this kind of highly filled material, I mean, we are talking about thermal conductivity between two and three watt per meter Kelvin. So this means we need to bring 
this thermal material, the, the uh, filler packages into the base resin. Um, this represents then a material in the end that is highly abrasive, right? I mean, you have lots of particles inside of the base resin, and this needs to be dispensed. This needs to be dispensed in a way that if you are, we are typically selling right now 2K materials, it's mixed in the right ratio, and you're making sure that you are filling also the right quantity at the right place in order to make sure that the gap is always completely filled, that there is no air and trap and that the thermal product the thermal conductivity is working in the in the right level so i think this part of dispensing high speed that kind of highly abrasive material has been and is still a very big challenge in the industry we're working closely with uh, equipment manufacturers testing our material up front making sure that the pumps are working um, also what is in the end the the usage how many spare parts you need so all that part of the calculation is a very important topic in, in that area and making this dispensing happen um, is key to the success of the electrified mobility i think Absolutely. Well, well, Stefan, I think that was that was really interesting insight on, on these aspects from Henkel's point of view. We're going to pick up quite a bit of those things back in in our panel discussion. But but for now, I'd like to to thank you very much again for for your insight here, and we'll we'll see you again shortly uh, on the panel. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, and 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 for the audience again, if you're interested, we we have had we have lots of content and coverage of with Henkel on on AMS, um, and one of the recent stories we have this one, fun, funny, not on e-mobility, but a very interesting perspective on uh, the display side um, of market, as, as Stefan was saying, there's many different factors to the business here. So there's a link which has been put in the chat for you to check that out as well. But um, now I'm I'm going to hand it back over to Nick for our final expert before we get to the panel. Thanks, Chris. Uh, our next panelist is Tom Larson. Um, Tom Larson joined Gustamp in 2011 as R&D Technical Centre Manager and has since overseen the production and development of structural and suspension components for chassis, as well as using innovation in materials, working to develop strong and lightweight components using steels, aluminium and hybrid materials. Um, Tom, can I welcome you to the to the screen? You there? Yep. Hi, Tom. Hi. Dan. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're going to take a slightly more focused look, perhaps, at uh, at some of the processes and the centre around sort of EV. Obviously, well-established company, Gestamp, so you have a lot of processes, as with all our panelists here, adapting to the life of of the electric vehicle now. So, I believe you have. Um, uh, a few slides and a few case studies just to discuss with us this afternoon. Yeah, I'll just run through a, a brief presentation um, and then we can come back to some questions. So um, if you can see my screen now on the slides. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. OK, so um, as introduced, my name is Tom Larson. I work for Gestamp. Um, I mainly focus on the chassis area. And today I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction to the business and some words about uh, what we're doing, uh, particularly focusing on um, hydroforming as a technology. Um, Gestamp's a multinational company specializing in design and development and manufacture uh, products for the main OEMs. Um, and the main focus is really around safety and light weighting for our products. The portfolio includes body and white products, chassis and mechanisms as well. Um, there's a global footprint where we're present in over 24 countries with more than 100 uh, production plants, 13 global R&D centers that work closely with our customers and more than 40,000 employees. Um, the company offer a lot of technologies, quite famed worldwide for hot stamping. Um, we also use cold stamping, welding technologies in chassis, laser welding, multi-step roll forming. Um, but today I just want to pick one of these technologies as an example um, and focus a little on hydroforming as, as a technology. Um, if we look around the world, um, we have a number of uh, hydroforming facilities. Um, uh, our main two learning sites are from Spain in Navarra and also in the UK in Acliffe, where I'm speaking to you from today. Um, but we've also expanded that into China and also Mexico where to meet the global requirements. You can see on the screen some of the details of the 
uh, fully automated um, hydroform lines, the number of presses and tonnage and the equipment around those areas as well. What I'd like to just come back to a little is, is you know, we're talking today about e-mobility and the impact that has. Um, I've pulled this slide together a bit chassis focused, I'll admit, but really the electric vehicles are, are influencing chassis and we see three main areas. These are the, the safety of the car. Um, and what we see is the increase in mass of battery boxes is increasing the potential energy of the car. And this um, it changes the crash dynamics of the vehicle and chassis products are contributing more towards the safety of the car as a whole. We also see it within comfort, quieter EVs are making less noise, therefore road noise is more audible by the passengers. And the electric motors are quite often integral to the chassis structures. So therefore what we're trying to do is minimize is that noise transfer and isolate it from the passenger area of the car as well. And the third area is really around EVs and climate change and CO2 emissions is the, the drive for light weighting in the vehicle as well. How we can, uh, through design processes, through materials and, and technologies, look at light weighting of products um, for the vehicle as well. As we're focusing here on, on, on um, hydroform products, I wanted to show you a little example. So in the videos here, you can see chassis products working on the car, how they're going over different events of cornering, accelerating and braking and how that transcribes to loads in the vehicle. We, we use these loads to develop robust projects like the hydroform rear subframe you can see here on the left. The example here is a steel hydroform frame from the Audi Q7 platform. Um, and uh, touching on Arno's the, uh, conversation about um, you know, modularization. This is one product that's used across a range of the um, Volkswagen group with Audi, Lamborghini, even Bentley, all using this common frame as one product with one core hydroform structure for that. I have another example of a product here. This is the aluminium hydroform rear subframe that we manufacture for the Jaguar Land Rover I-Pace car. Um, and what you can see here is the aluminium hydroform tubes that form the core structure. And this mounts the high power um, electric motor in the rear of the car driving the rear um, wheels. And you can see on this side, around the outside, some of the features from hydroforming technology that, that have, offer some benefits, including weld reduction from the tubes, accuracy and of the uh, form of the pressings, and the ability to reduce wall thickness for light weighting of products as well. The last example I've got in this brief presentation really is looking at the electric vehicles and obviously the battery packs that, that come with this and protecting them, especially in the role of safety and side crashes and, and protecting the battery boxes so there's no leaks. Here you can see a, a, a solution from Gestamp with Hydroform um, products uh, protecting the battery boxes. And these are relevant also for low intrusion requirements and side crash as well as shown in this video here. So we can look at rocker components to control intrusion and basically achieve high energy absorption in that area, which is important from the protection of the battery itself. Also from the occupants that there's a high energy absorption in these products and lower intrusion speed. And we also can look at these solutions from the balance of cost and weight reduction as well. So it's an example where, as, as we've mentioned, there's large investment in these new electric vehicles. So we're trying to constantly look at reducing cost in the products as well. So that was a, a kind of brief overview of the, of, of the uh, chassis products there um, to support the uh, presentation today. Thanks, Tom. Um, it was interesting, actually, because when I saw that you were going to be covering hydroforming, um, I, I read up recently that hydroforming is, I consider it quite niche, relatively speaking, and um, I can't, could be wrong in that, but, but it's now, I read that it's predicted to experience the fastest growth of all the forming technologies in the sort of coming, coming 
you know, near future sort of thing. I mean, we've been talking about for a long time about sort of hot forming and things has been the, the big topic. So would you agree with, with that sort of statement about hydroforming? And if so, why do you think that might be? Um, we've seen some areas where the technology can be applied with um, uh, very good performance and and like i said earlier it's that performance cost balance uh, as well in in the package and the the sill example at the end there um it's an alternative to aluminium extrusion technology so it, it can be a, a good uh, technology to apply um and i think over the years you know hydroforming is not a new technology um, and it's something we've got deep knowledge on through um, producing parts like that for years um, and what we're seeing is the learning from internal combustion engine being applied to EVs with with potentially good uh, opportunity for weight reduction there as well. Do you, do you see um... EV being a particularly strong market for, for hydroform parts? Because obviously they're trying lots of combinations for the vehicle structures, looking for lightweight and strength, as you mentioned, in different aspects. Do you see that being a boost for hydroform at all? I think where I talked about some of the impacts that um, EVs offer, like, like for, um, if I take an example of, of safety and crash, um, you know, the design of a closed section where you can control that um for from a strength perspective and if you can take advantage of high strength steels with with tubular products for hydroforming as well it can offer a really good advantage and i think protecting the battery box as the last um, body and white example showed and if you look at you know particularly these high torque powered motors in chassis products as well the hydroform rear subframe if package allows in the design of the product can be a really good solution for um, for um, controlling that that torque uh, and inertia of the motor as well in the design. So, as I've shown those those three examples, even the um, Audi Q7 is used on the PHEV variant of the car as well. Um, I pace pure battery electric vehicle, and the cells are there mainly to protect the battery boxes. So yes, I, I think on EVs the, the technology could be relevant. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you mentioned there it's an established process and one that uh, Gestamp have got some considerable experience in. I mean, are, are there any new developments around the process in terms of, I mean, it might be sort of digitalization of it or is, are there, is there anything kind of current or is, or is it pretty much settled the, the way it works at the moment? I, th I think, uh, as we said, you know, technology has been around for us since the 1990s um, and we've been using it a long time, but uh, it, uh, technologies have to evolve um, and develop and, and, and we have continued doing that. You know, we have new presses, new processes, um, as I mentioned and, and touching on, on Tanya's presentation, you know, all of our hydroforming facilities are fully automated now um, and um, we, we're also looking at uh, new materials you know there are new steels we're working with the steel suppliers on new tubular steel properties to, to continue um, you know improving the mechanical properties reducing wall thickness improving corrosion protection all these things with products that just help us deliver better products to our customers and and equally you know Gestamp have a, a whole group that's very strong on the industry 4.0 topics and we're doing a lot of that in the hydroforming process as well a lot of our lines are fully monitored and we're collecting that data so we're getting continual learning to optimize the process and 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 to use it more also one other thing you know with global production and with 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 trying to reduce investment and things like that we're constantly trying to monitor you know we make more than one hydroform tube from one tool set you know we might make the whole car set from one shot if you like and then laser trim those products so we're constantly trying to push how to maximize the technology and, and minimize cost and weight and and increase performance for you know particularly in chassis products durability is very important on the these vehicles as well yeah and it's interesting you're saying there about how you can get more than one part out of out of one sort of shot i mean i, I was kind of thinking about this and i suppose you've answered the question in one way high volume vehicle production i mean in terms of the application of hydroforming in that because it has in the past been quite sort of niche i know in sports cars they've used it in the past but do you see 
do you see it in terms of its scale it being ramped up more for for um uh, and being a, a cost effective process for for ramping up in terms of higher scale of volume I, th I think it, it has the capability definitely um, and, and I think that's why you know we, we, we're we rolling it out globally you know we, we have it not just in Europe you know it's expanding in America and China as well um, and the automization of the lines enables that efficiency of, of the and, and, and you know um, I think Tanya touched on she, she worded it as re, repurposing um, we talk about flexible manufacturing and um, you know we're looking at smart factories and autonomous vehicles AGVs to, to improve that and you can do that within a hydroforming facility on its own you know um, and I, th I think for us um, that flexibility and bringing that into the hydroforming approach really can help I, I would add you know hydroforming is one technology um, mm -hmm. Uh, the design of a hydroform product is, is really powerful as a designer you can change the section you can you know you've got a closed section which you know is very good from a structural perspective um, but sometimes there just isn't the package space to root a tube even if you can change it you know so we need that flexibility of different technologies if the package space if the loads requirements are there hydroforming can be an excellent solution if they're not you know we can rely on other technologies as well for me the key is not a you know we're, we're not a, a workman turning up with one tool to do a job you know we we, we have this flexibility of, of products and hydroforming is one of them that i think is relevant for the ev market at the moment thanks tom um we're just going to draw this bit to a to a close now if you want to stay on we're um uh, i'm going to bring chris backing i think we've got we did a recent um interview an article with this company so you, you can read online uh, some comments from Tom in there as well which is really interesting um, so, sorry uh, yeah, just, uh, yes and, and there's a link to that article there and also just just a quick reminder to everyone before we bring everyone back for our for our panel discussion and we've already had some great comments and questions from the audience is that this is part one in a series uh, part two of our live stream series on EV electrification, electrifying production is on May 6th. Um, and you can register in the link that is uh, going to be provided to you. We've, we have guests, including uh, Danny Alverswald from Volkswagen, or Volkswagen, maybe we should be saying, yeah, or um, uh, the electric vehicle ahead of the Dresden plant, which is producing the ID3. And we'll also be joined by Chris White. Um, electrification manager for manufacturing engineering uh, for Europe and Ford. So, so really a, a great way to continue this conversation. We're going to focus a little bit more on some of the OEMs in, in that one. But let's let's get back to our uh, to our, our session today. Really excited to welcome everyone back um, after those great segments and, and insight. If I can bring back Arno Gullering, Tom Larson, Tanya Veno, um, and, and Stefan Hofer. Great to have you all back in the room. Excellent. So let's kick off. One of the things that I think has come out of covering these different range of specializations and the changes that are happening is clearly that there are new skills, competencies, facilities, processes that are coming into, into the um, um, EV space for suppliers. And I'd like to get a sense of what some of the... Um, but, but, but in doing that, obviously, there's a lot of existing competencies that we're using carrying forward, which I want to kind of kind of get talking about a little bit. Maybe I can start with with Arno at ZF. Um, we talked earlier a lot about the changes for electrification that ZF has, has done. But what, what have been the existing competencies that have been most useful, particularly for you in the powertrain side in transitioning to EV? Uh, quite a couple of them. Um, actually, um, as I said earlier, um, electrified powertrain mainly consists, as we um, heard that um, earlier also from uh, Stefan and from Tanya, um, pretty much out of three main areas, if you don't account for the battery. It's the power unit, it's the, um, the e-motor and um, the gearing. Yeah? We as a gearbox manufacturer since a uh, long time, obviously gearing competence uh, helps us a lot. And um, you have to understand the gearing for an e-drive train is somewhat different from a normal ICE drive train because you do not have the masking noise from the um, ICE. Yeah, I mean, and also um, the RPM level 
where an electric motor is um, revving towards, um, during operation is um, quite higher. Huh? We, we talk about um, RPMs up to 80,000. Yeah? And if you do not have the right gearing and the right, let's say, high precision surface, you hear awful um, growling noises, yeah, and that's what the industry deals with, yeah. So it's it's not easy at all to enter um, this uh, competence. So that that uh, helps help, helped us tremendously to enter this business. Yeah? And then <clears throat> obviously um, the competences you need overall is systems. Yeah, we talk about complex systems, so systems engineering, systems design systems manufacturing um, and systems industrialization is, is needed and, and there we are quite competent um, also for a number of years and ultimately you have to ideally go into electronics and into e-motor um, manufacturing as well and we very very early did that yeah? and compared to others we are a little bit ahead of time uh, i would say now for both um, what's important in the e motor area, um, the trend goes to, as, as we heard before, into modularity and also into smaller sizes. The power density um, is getting up and up and up. And that uh, makes us um, going from winding technology to hairpin technology. That's very important because it's a high precision technology. You have to, have to cover this. And ultimately, electronic. Yeah, we do see. Um, a shift from 400 volt to 800 volt. That's in our point of view the next step. Yeah, it brings a lot of um, advantages for weight, for copper um, reduction, for charging speed, for um, endurance and all those things. And for 800 volt electronics you need a complete new power unit and uh, you better uh, uh, you are better off if you if you enter this area early yeah, and that's what we did and, and uh, so it's a number of as you heard several times a number of really new requirements for both manufacturing and for product design that's great maybe um, maybe tanya avbs obviously you know many of the many applications of carry over across both sides but but what 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 abb do you think is sort of most uh, some of the most important core competencies that are helping you make this transition i i, I would like to come back to what i mentioned earlier for, for us it's been also a transition from robot supplier to automation solutions provider and if we, if you think about flexible and kind of moving away solving a piece of welding to our customers where of course we add value to our customers and these are important projects as well. But I think if we really want to be the automation partner, then we really need to be able to be the partner for flexible manufacturing moving ahead. So if I look at our competence development journey now in, 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 in this, so it's, for example, uh, for the for the plastics, I just hired a person who is a former factory manager because I want him to understand the architecture of the factory, the flow of the factory. And, that, 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 and when we combine that with robotics knowledge, then I think we can really be the part to provide those solutions. So that's, uh, that's for sure is one thing. The second thing is the digital know-how. So we talk a lot more about data collection. We talk about smart factories. And now all of the application cells that we provide come with the digital layer automatically. So that's uh, something that we are very much investing in. Then ease of use, so uh, you know, ease of uh, ease of deploy, easy, easy to program. That's something that I think it's extremely important moving ahead and taking uh, manufacturing and automation to the next level. And then collaborative robots. So we are now looking not only looking at uh, you know these very traditional parts, but also parts where humans and robots collaborate. And that's another angle and very much linked to by the way ease of use so ease of programming ease of use so these are some of the aspects that are very very much now gaining importance and, and this is where we are investing and also training of people fantastic stefan did you want to add any any to that i mean some, some themes that came across uh, in our discussion as well i think there 
Yes, absolutely. Happy to do so. And I think that um, one point that, that Arno just mentioned is uh, also from, from our perspective, being a materials uh, supplier, very, very critical. And that's when you're looking to the electric vehicles about the, um, the voltage size. Um, so uh, I fully agree with uh, with Arno to say we are seeing uh, a high increase here. We are expecting 800 volts to to kick in soon, and so we are talking about high voltage applications in the vehicle, right? That's something that didn't exist before. We were talking about classically 12, 24 volts, things like that, but for sure not about high voltage applications. Um, we as Henkel take here the advantage of our industrial part of the business, right? I mean, we are also working with the industrial applications for inverters. We are used to use high voltage applications. Now it's about translating that into the vehicle. So combining liquids with non-liquid materials, making sure that there is no way for, for a short in one of the applications within the vehicle. So that's kind of, of, of that things that are, are kicking in for us uh, here as, as Henkel. And um, quickly to the, to the point of the manufacturing, from, from, from our materials perspective, there is another challenge as well. Um, so uh, also the production footprint as, as such is changing, right? When you're talking now through the OEMs, and maybe that's something you're also observing out of the media uh, with uh, the battery manufacturers, as an example, also coming over more and more to Europe. So the OEMs are requesting their suppliers to be close by their production sites. Yeah? And that's also valid for us. So also when you're thinking about these liters and tons of material that we are producing for the battery, there is no way to ship that around the globe, right? So this means that we have new manufacturing facilities requirement, very big volumes that we need to cover, and that's another challenge within the supply chain, I would say, for, for this automotive electrification. Okay, Tom, do you, do, you, do you have something to add to that? Because obviously Gestamp has uh, a range of competencies, products, processes that you've been working with with, with the usual, uh, the ICE classification cars, but EV, I mean, I'm assuming you were well placed in, in respect of what you've been discussing to move into the EV sector. Has it been a big change or has it been more gradual? I, th I think for us, a, a lot of our products, is it's not too big a change. Obviously, battery boxes are a brand new product, um, so that, that is a big change. But as, as um, in the AMS article that we, we did with you a while ago, we spoke about, you know, chassis, the, the requirement, stiffness, strength, durability, you know, vehicle dynamics, it's still holding wheels on a car. Fundamentally, it's very similar. The powertrain is changing, the package, the environment is changing, but it's quite similar. Um, and I think, I think for me, when we talk about competencies and listening to the other uh, speakers there, um, for me, there's one one point, and I think Tanya touched on it, and it, it's about people really as well, and about skills and, and, and ability. And one of the things for me is the competence, you know, I, just going back to the hydroforming thing, you know, we were very strong in Europe um, it, with that, and we launched it in, in uh, Mexico. But part of that process was to bring that team over to Europe to train them for three months on, you know, bring the tooling engineers, the the process people, the the um, the, the manufacturing plant people that would be responsible over to Europe to learn. And then when they were going through the launch phases in in, in uh, Mexico, the European experts went across to support them through the launch phase. And I think that that competence and sharing that knowledge. And I think sometimes we can get very sucked into technology and forget that there, there's a lot of humans involved in this. I know maybe with automation, we don't, you know, it's not always everything, but that human interface is really important. And, and that competence and skill and experience is, is really important as well. And, it, and it's something we support very strongly. And, and it's, it's an, uh, just to, to lead on from that, the. The idea of obviously we've just asked about the competencies you have and how they've been transferable. But I mean, Tanya mentioned it there, and Tom, um, we're also seeing a lot of tier suppliers um, acquiring new competencies, buying not just bringing in people, but obviously buying new whole new companies, like a lot around IT, but not just that. Um, could I, I mean, could I go to you, Stefan? Is is that something that Hen could have done? Are they are they uh, are they have they acquired or had a need to acquire new? Companies, because you were mentioning the challenges, not just of the materials, but dispensing, storing, all that sort of thing for, excuse me, for the battery pack. So lots of new challenges there. So how, how Henkel sort of tackled that? 
No, I think that's a, it's a very valid point and uh, uh, we can uh, link into what also the, the other companies are doing here, right? So the, the journey through the electrification for, for, for us as companies in this field has already started earlier than what is now perceived by the end customers, let's say. So um, the acquisition, for example, of Berquist um, being the market leader on thermal materials back in 2015, 2016 of Enkel has been already a strategic step in that direction very clearly, right? So um, this means with this, we have also broadened our competencies in this thermal context and are now combining that with our high level of expertise and adhesives looking through that materials. On the other hand, what we are also seeing very clearly is that um, we are now, and I think that's also valid for the other colleagues here in the line, more and more also looking for innovation through startups, through venture capital possibilities. We are seeing companies looking technology from a different angle um, and also here we are very very uh, closely working with the market understanding what are new ideas coming uh, in what are future driven uh, initiatives um, the, the statement uh, I think Tanya mentioned before on big data understanding what is the, the data the reporting you can get on EVs on the road so all that kind of let's say surrounding know-how and knowledge is what we are also trying to acquire through that way so a very big change is here and yes I think that acquisition is, is pushing growth in that direction very clearly could I could I pass that back to Arno? Is that something that, that ZF have, have, have looked into or done um, in terms of acquisitions and gaining more competencies? Yeah, I, I mentioned that earlier. We did that twice oh, in the recent um, um, in the recent uh, time. Um, I mean, when you when you talk about this act, this change we're seeing right now, uh, everybody's talking about the drivetrain, yeah, because that's what the end customer sees, yeah. But it's much more. Yeah, I mean, and I do not want to go too far into this field now. Um, it is it is more in into the usage of cars. What's the what's the future in mobility like? Yeah, and as a car manufacturer, we see that from a lot of OEMs, they're not only changing the pure propulsion. Yeah, they also invest quite substantially into automated driving. Yeah, so we did both. Yeah, we bought um, an electronics company years ago already and changed that to the power unit, uh, to a power man unit manufacturer. And um, as I said, most recently, the acquisition of Abco was targeted more into get, uh, getting more knowledge into automated driving. Right? And here, especially in the transport sector, uh, obviously. So you cannot, you cannot really keep up with the speed needed if you are not able to acquire somebody uh, here and there. That's absolutely the, the way to go. <clears throat> Maybe we need to buy a few more semiconductor companies in the meantime anyway, but uh, we'll leave that discussion for another another panel. Um, yeah. Kept us busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder, you know, this has come up a few times, but I just thought I wanted to give a few others a chance to comment on it. You know, we're talking a lot about these relationships sort of changing opportunities to work earlier in the process, you know, to, to be, as Tanya alluded to, the strategic partner. And, and I just wanted to kind of tie that in a bit more on the opportunities that that might bring to manufacturing services. And maybe if I can just start with you again, Tanya, on that. So, you know, is that already happening? Are you working earlier already with these customers to, to, to be that automation partner that you talked about, designed for automation? Do you want to just color that a little bit further for us? No, absolutely. And I think it has, again, the technology aspect and then it has a business model aspect, I would say. But from the technology aspect, I think we are really moving away from, especially companies like ABB, there are always small integrators that serve the tier ones in one country and then they make this one building assembly or one door panel assembly or, or whatever might be optimum for but when we really talk about scalable solutions that look the same, has the same manual, has the same HMI, has the same software across the world in 50 or 100, uh, uh, 100 factories, then, then, then the partnerships in creating those solutions already from the beginning on together is extremely important because it really goes beyond then understanding also optimizing if we go to this modular scalable cells then it starts with design for design for robotics i would say or design for automation and that of course i think you arno mentioned earlier that it, it requires also that you open up 
and you share information that is really uh, strategic for you. So, uh, you know, if, in case of ZF, they, if we would do that together, then Arno would be sharing some of the key process factors with me in order to automate those processes uh, uh, on, on, on a scalable basis. So it, 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 it's about trust and it's about opening up and, and co-creating, I would say. So this, this is certainly from the technology point of view. And then, you know, looking at also partnerships, then, then you move beyond just the process process step, I would say, that you move beyond also then uh, looking at uh, integrating quality inspection and process. So we have, we use vision systems, for example, where we do the welding and in the same in line, in the weld seam inspection. So it's kind of bringing multiple process steps into one. And once again, you are sharing information that is very strategic for your production. And the second aspect is actually uh, a little bit, I think, what Tom, you also uh, were touching about, uh, is the new business model. So when, when we move to the uh, move to more flexible, kind of world requiring more flexibility, then what we are doing with our customers is, is also looking at new business model, models like pay by use or pay by products uh, produced that gives the flexibility of moving from CapEx to OPEX for our customers, and then also uh, taking some of that risk of earlier investment away. And, and maybe then the third part is also the kind of the partnership and new ways to work together is how do we make sure that in the past you probably needed 12, 18 months to do a production ramp up. And now with the EV, and this is driven by the North American EV companies, for sure, they are asking you to build a line, not in 12 months, but in the six months. <laughs> and then again, you need to completely new ways to work together, because if you have six months to put the line together, me as an automation provider, I have maximum two months to put the robotic line together. So, so, so and, and that again requires a different, uh, different type of collaboration moving ahead. So these are a couple of very concrete uh, examples that we are doing today. Perfect, actually. Um, we have just a little bit of echo on the line. If, if I can just ask when people aren't talking to just mute, it just will, when we get to this many people, it tends to to, to cause in a bit of a feedback loop. Stefan, can I maybe ask you to, to comment on on that side from, from Henkel's point of view in terms of those changing relationships as well? And then we've got a couple of great audience questions we'll, we'll jump onto as well. Yes, absolutely. And I think that Tanya made a, a few very, very important points that we are also observing from, from our side. So on the one hand, this uh, incredible acceleration, um, and on the other hand, also the more and more shortened cycles. Yeah? I mean, uh, when, when I joined the automotive industry, and that was before the, the EV uh, wave, let's call it that way, um, automotive was very much predictive, right? I mean, you knew a bit what's going to happen in the market. You knew knew when which cost reduction program of which OEM would happen. So that was all kind of that. There was no crystal ball needed. Everything was set, and and that has changed dramatically over the last time. And this has also on the on the one hand, it's for sure challenges. On the other hand, that's also bearing some opportunities. And one interesting piece in that context is uh, the topic about uh, the dispensing, the dispensability, the equipment, uh, and also the corresponding testing. I mean, when you're talking about materials, you're usually also expecting then long-term testing, testing of the stability, testing of the material in the application, you name it. And one uh, that's for sure part of it is also then um, a long-term testing of the material performance, right? So these are all things that have been done typically in the past at the tier one or the OEM that are more and more getting over into the hands of us as a materials supplier. So on the one hand, we are then using and leveraging our close network with equipment manufacturers. On the other hand, we are also having more and more own equipment within Henkel premises in order to run trials, to run tests, to do trainings with customers upfront to then the, the serial production. So that's another aspect that has, I think, changed a lot in, in that way of collaboration. Yeah? That's great. And and, and I, I just thought, um, sorry to steal the thunder there, Nick, I think I just wanted to grab a, a quick audience question here, or, or possibly not quick, but one of the, the questions that have come in is uh, on vertical integration from OEMs, um, so, you know, more insourcing. Uh, and the question was, you know, we're slowly seeing uh, vertical integration in systems like e-axles, motors, inverters, et cetera, 
um, which systems and EVs might be a threat for tier ones and how do tier ones um, you know, bring about a solid proportion to still be about. So how do they kind of maintain their share of the value chain, I suppose? It's a bit of a strategic question that maybe more, maybe it's not entirely as manufacturing related, but um, um, I thought, you know, is this is this aspect of insourcing, Tom, for example, something that Gestamp is seeing either at the OEM side for your customers or or indeed further upstream for, for Gestamp um, in, in terms of your supply chain? I, th I think... Um... We, we touched on in the presentations the the, the dynamic change of the of the of um, uh, not just uh, e-mobility but mobility uh, as as Arno mentioned it isn't just electric cars it's also autonomous and shared ownership and things like that and I think as the OEMs are addressing this and changing their models and you know like Volkswagen with the um, MEB platform you know launching new completely new production plants to produce these cars um it, it's a big investment time and, and a big change there and i think for some commodities um the the oems need reliable partners that they can rely on to do that while they're concentrating on the on the dynamic new um and what what we found in this this period of change is that for for our product for our portfolio which well may well be different for other commodities um that actually you know oems are relying on a on a reliable partner who can do that pre-development be involved early in the process be integrated to, to make sure what we do is modular does work with the platform um but equally we can take that responsibility and it's one less thing for them to be thinking about i know through other sessions like this there are other commodities on the car which are you know more bought in house by OEMs so I'm only speaking from from my experience but really we see that outsourcing technology to, to reliable partners as key um, and, and maybe I, I, I am not an expert on this but areas like software development and that OEMs want to bring in-house because they want all the systems to work on these cars much more um, um, in that way whereas structural products like ours where you're looking at performance and design for manufacture and we can offer both we understand the product and we have the factories to understand the DFM um, can be where is where we add value really if that answers your question. Thanks, Tom. Um, I just we've got to, we've, I've got a really interesting question from the audience here. This is a bit of a crystal ball moment for all of you in the sense of looking forward. So, the question here is: um, beyond the immediate challenges of light weighting, battery production, efficiency, range of the vehicles, what do you see being the next? important factor for vehicle making from from perspectives what will be the, the key challenges requirements that from your customers um going forward beyond those immediate, those immediate challenges we've, we've spoken about today i mean or well, we're not looking that far forward this moment <laughs> we've got enough, enough to deal with now maybe <laughs> so um, i mean arno would you could you i think sustainability yeah, that's that's a topic we did not uh, touch today. Uh, it sustainability came up uh, very recently, uh, also with a, a quite challenging speed. We do see from the main OEMs um, that uh, they request very early in the sourcing process um, they request a clear roadmap, a clear idea, and a clear program for sustainability. For sustainability yeah? um, we um, have that. On a corporate basis, we want to be climate neutral by 2040 and cut by half uh, by 2030. And uh, how we approach that is that for existing plans, we come up with clear roadmaps and for new plans, and we're building up a, quite a couple of them right now for especially electronics and, and uh, those uh, topics, uh, we, um, we apply uh, guidelines uh, to, to really fulfill this sustainability needs. Uh, so, and also with this comes uh, remanufacturing of these drive trains. Uh, that's something which we have to uh, bring to. I mean, we, we are we are in the early steps there, and we have, of course we have uh, programs for that for that and uh, concepts. Yeah? But this is something which is getting more and more important. Yeah? And and uh, as Tanya said, 
the life cycles of products and also for production equip equipment getting shorter and shorter and shorter, we have to uh, be ready for that very early. Yeah, and, and not when it comes around the corner. I think that sustainability point is an interesting one, and I wondered if if maybe um, Stefan, did you want to? Is that is that? I know from even conversations from some of your OEM customers of some projects involved. So on the sustainability side, is that also playing a key role for you in the mobility division? Absolutely. So I can only agree to what Arno was saying before, besides the fact that uh, the, the reduction of CO2 footprint for us as a company is also for sure one of the, the key drivers. We're seeing that also then in regards to the recyclability, second life of batteries, repairability, so reopening of batteries, exchanging of modules or cells. I think that's still a path to go, um, but it will also become uh, one of the very, very big challenges. And then for sure, the question on the recycling as such is a, is a very big topic where we are also in exchange with OEMs, with other players in the market to understand what could we as a materials supplier bring to the table? Uh, what can we uh, take in consideration? What can we ease in order looking to the recyclability as such? So very, very important topic from for us as well. Um, another topic that we are seeing as coming up in, in the industry a lot now is also the safety as such. Not that safety has not been a topic before, right? But um, we are seeing that now also coming now through through certain legislation. Yeah. So as an example, in China, you have now this rule that uh, if a car, if a battery catches fire, thermal propagation prevention is a key topic now in the market. So um, the driver needs to be in the position to leave the car and even also take, for instance, kids or disabled people from the rear seats so that at least the battery withstands five minutes uh, when it caught fire. So that's not something that is not only a technical hurdle, but there are also really governmental requirements that the OEMs need to fulfill. And that's then also their uh, presenting an, another challenge, let's say, in the electrification of the vehicle, just as an additional topic that I see coming. Great. Well, we're, we're we're running. We're starting to get close to the hour, but and 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 as I think we could go easily another hour. But um, just a few. Um, we'll, we'll try and go quick on on one or two points. One thing I wanted to ask you, Tanya, because it's come up quite a bit, is um, a, a, around the mod. You know, the cellular manufacturing and modular. What would a best-in-class modular layout design look like for, for for tier ones? I mean, how would you? Where would we kind of start with that? I think it really starts uh, in the kind of seeing the factory as a whole. So, um, making sure that uh, the flexibility is, uh, I believe that the, the real benefits of flexibility are there when when manufacturers have the courage to redesign the complete line. And this is, of course, when we think, think about now, there's not going to be too many greenfield investments. So, if we think about brownfield, so uh, and it's it's not always easy to do. So uh, I think here uh, finding the balance that uh, what what is the right level and 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 uh, kind of how to do it in the brownfield factories where you have the existing layout uh, uh, and and kind of driving this process change also in the brownfield. I think that's that that's one of the keys in the cellular manufacturing because if you build a new plant, it's very easy to do a flexible line. It's much more difficult when you are when you are running a brown brownfield uh, operations. So uh, and and I think uh, talking about sustainability also here maybe touching on that point. I think part of the part of this flexibility is also a key part of the sustainability because there are still two, there's a lot of overcapacity in automotive because there are lines that can pro produce only one part. And that means that you have 60% utilization, 70% utilization, 30% utilization. So this flexibility and having the possibility to run multiple parts of the line ties also to the sustainability picture that was uh, that was discussed. So I would say, I would say really it's about flexibility, and and it will look different for ZF than it looks for Gestamp or Henkel because this you really have there's no one size fits for all. It's really understanding the process and co-creating creating the models that work for that specific customer for that specific operation. So. There is no one one uh, one size fits for all. It's about co-creating, but also having the ability and courage to do that already. Also for the brownfield, I think this is one of the key elements moving moving ahead. And and again, it's not only about manufacturing. It's about uh, uh, materials handling, HEVs, and software. 
that is tied to the manufacturing process. That's a great point. I think I think what we'll do to close is let's have a of a of a I mean brief a kind of like your your thirty second priority list for scaling up um, you know EV EV business because that's all it should take right. Um, but uh, just just to close from each each member, if we can just kind of get maybe I'll, I'll turn to you first, Tom, from the Kastamp's point of view. Obviously, we've heard about some great manufacturing solutions. What would you what would you kind of put as your top priorities for for scaling up um, EV opera EV operations for Kastamp? I think for us, the um, um, a lot of the technology we're actually, I mean, we're delivering EV products today um, for the for the cars today. But as we look forward in the future, I think the the, the investment we're making on smart factories on this on this one invest it, it's quite an investment intensive business um, and getting the most out of those investments so you have that flexibility and if we think about platforms where you have a ramp up a production and a ramp down and maybe multiple vehicles that's where that investment's really important so our, our looking at um, uh, flexibility is key and I, I'll come back to it and I'm sorry repetition but the sustainability um, looking at solutions that you know uh, if all the EVs are driven around climate change, which is what was driven around tailpipe emissions, and rightly so, I think, is now around life cycle analysis more accurately. And, and I think if we look at innovations, you know, exotic materials, things like that, the end of life becomes really important um, and, a, and a bit of a barrier. But for me, the one thing that seems most important from the customers at the moment is cost. Um, a lot of these um, technologies all come with cost. And, um, you know, w with COVID, with the impact that's had financially, cost is still a really important factor and can be a barrier to some of these technologies as well um, that need to be mindful of. Very important point there. Oh no, your 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 thirty your thirty second priority list for for EV. Digitalize it. Yeah, we do see um, a quick uh, rise also in automation of the equipment because we are dealing with um, a lot less parts. Yeah, I mean I said that earlier. Uh, we roughly calculated it's two point five to one. Yeah, from the ICE drivetrain to the E drivetrain, it's a lot less parts. Those parts have to be very precise. We talked about um, the high RPM we do see here, and we do uh, we did talk about the NVH requirements, very high NVH requirements. We do test a lot in the manufacturing equipment. We have a number of test stations for um, EUL testing and also for other process steps. And the key to be efficient and cost cost saving is to use this data we acquire from the manufacturing processes and not only from one line and not only from one plant but for several plants and then interconnected yeah to really get the i mean you have you have the situation that you have several plants ultimately um, producing the products which come to, together to the drive train and uh, the data you acquire within while while producing this in, the, in this process steps in this production processes can can bring with the application of artificial intelligence can really lower your rework rate, your scrap rate, and ultimately your efficiency. That's the key in the future, my point of view. Excellent, Stefan. Yeah, I mean, um, not not very many new topics to to add. So I think uh, for for us, one of the key strategic priorities is definitely to use this adhesive part as an enabler for for new designs, for reduction of weight, uh, for for bringing new efficiency gains into the EV platforms as such. I was quickly touching base on this thermal propagation prevention, so passenger safety being a, a very very important topic uh, in the industry where we would like also to play. Uh, a role with our solutions and definitely when it comes to sustainability not repeating what we have been saying before but the topic of recyclability of materials what we can bring here as a solution i would say that's the the three main priorities that i would see right now as a challenge for all of us uh, to bring them the electrification to the next level wonderful and tanya would you add any anything further to that no i think a lot of has said i personally believe that the next five years in automo automotive industry are going to be more exciting than the last 25 years combined. So there's a lot of 
it's an exciting place to be and there's a lot of change it's accelerating and the, pur the purpose of my organization is that me we materialize that future for our customers and in that it's really about transforming together that's what i would uh, that's what i would call the next five years transforming together and in in together with our customers but also together with my organization as a global organization and what i believe that we need to have in this, this journey of transformation in materializing the future is we need partnerships we need innovation we need speed and we need the people we need people with the right mindset people uh, with, with innovation with uh, with with curiosity and, and if we have that mixture, then I'm sure that we will be able to get there. So I'm really looking forward to the next five years. I certainly like that, transforming together. I think that is an excellent excellent point on which to sort of wrap up our, our, our panel here. Um, firstly, a big thank you to, to every, every one of you and all of your time, Arno, Stefan, Tanya, and Tom, for this fantastic insight and, and sharing and exchange. We've had more audience questions, which we'll address afterwards with, with everyone, make sure uh, some of the questions that were asked didn't get a chance to, that we didn't get a chance to address, that we pick up on. Thanks as well to the partnership today um, from ABB and Henkel in, 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 in producing and putting on this this live stream. We much appreciate the partnership. Find out more about these great companies on our website as well as, as theirs. And you can read more on these topics in our last two digital editions, one on e-mobility and one on tier supplies, which share a common thread running through. And the things that our panel have discussed today are picked up on here and, and, and some of the articles also appear in there, but much more. So you can have a look at those on our on our website and you'll be able to watch uh, this, this live stream on, on catch up when we upload it to our website. So if you would like to be it again, or you would like to direct some of your colleagues to it that didn't manage to see it, then you can go to our website and look under the spotlight banner and you will find it there in the next few days, I would guess, when we get that put up there. <laughs> we'll, 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 get, we'll get it up for sure. For sure before Easter, we'll have it up. We'll have it up for so. Um, so in case you missed part of it as well, you can go back to. Um, don't forget to register for, for part two of this series coming up in May. Registration is already open. We, as mentioned earlier, we've got some great guests and experts joining us there. Link again on the chat for those uh, for those who haven't yet. Um, so please do so. And yeah, as Nick, meant, or Nick already mentioned, we, uh, we're, we, we'll have this and many other live streams and digital products and coverage across the website and on Spotlight, our, our, our home for on-demand content. So please visit it there. Um, get in touch with us, with Nick, with, with myself, if you have ideas or, or further things you want to add. Um, and just thanks so much, everyone, for this exchange and to our great panel again. Uh, we, we really enjoyed it. Yeah, big thanks to the panel. Really enjoyed this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.